Hi guys, my name is Kirby Smith, and today I'm going to talk to you about a topic that is central to my own research while also fitting under the guise of alternative to FinFET technology. And that topic is a relatively new class of materials called transition metal dichalcogenides, or TMDs for short. But before I start, uh, here's the general outline of the video. I'll briefly go over what a TMD actually is, and then jump into why these materials are beginning to look attractive for end of the roadmap technologies and I'll finish up with the main issues facing these materials from a fabrication perspective. So, what is a transition metal dichalcogenide? Well, if you break the name down, a TMD is exactly what it sounds like. A unit cell of a monolayer TMD consists of one transition metal atom and two chalcogens. But it's kind of a mouthful to keep saying transition metal dichalcogenide, so I'll just say TMD for the rest of the video. But first, to show you guys why anyone is even interested in these materials anyway, I'm going to paint a bit of a background. So, to jump right in, we all know that traditional silicon bulk devices looked something like this. But as Moore's Law marched along, lots of changes in device geometry had to happen to compensate for parasitic effects, including buried oxides, halo doping, strain channels, high K metal gates, etc., all of which allowed for thinner EOT and higher drive currents for high performance devices. And finally, another geometry change was made for increased electrostatic control, which we now know as trigate or finfets. But even this architecture is already running out of steam, so what do we do next? Well, once SiO2 ran out of steam as a gate dielectric, and then we replaced that material with high Ks. So maybe once silicon runs out of steam as a channel, we can replace that with a new material as well. Uh, and that was actually a bit of a spoiler to the question right here of why we might need TMDs in the first place. As we continue to make our transistors smaller and smaller, two big issues arise. The first issue is a geometrical one. The shape of the transistor, coupled with necessary metal plugs and interconnects, leads to some very large parasitic capacitances and resistances that have to be carefully balanced to minimize the overall time constant associated with turning this guy on. The second issue is with the material itself. Silicon, as well as germanium and 3.5 materials, are intrinsically three-dimensional. So when you try to make them very, very thin, they lose their bulk properties that made them so appealing in the first place. Uh, this is illustrated in this figure over here for ultra-thin body semiconductor and insulator materials, uh, specifically silicon and germanium, showing that below a thickness of 3 or 4 nanometers, the mobility of these materials tanks pretty hard. To add to this, in 2006, some guys at IBM did a pretty thorough review of scaling rules for various transistor architectures, and in that paper they show that the minimum gate length of the FinFET or similar double-gated device can have is given to first order uh, by this expression right here. And the shortest you can make any transistor and expect to maintain electrostatic control with your gate is about 1.5 times this natural scaling length. So just plugging in some values from uh, the ITRS table, and assuming we want to keep our semiconductor thickness above 2 nanometers so that it still works okay for its mobility, we can see that without playing lots of extra tricks, we can't really expect to be able to scale these 3D materials to gate lengths shorter than 9 or 10 nanometers. So, as my figure on the right here might imply, one possible solution to that is to start looking at lower dimensional materials. Because CNTs already have their own video, I'll steer clear of them, uh, and graphene, despite its hype, was never really well suited for logic in the first place since it lacks a band gap. Therefore, I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about this relatively new field of 2D materials called TMDs, and I'll focus on molybdenum disulfide, uh, aka MOS2, since this guy is more or less the poster child for this field advantages. Here you can see a ball and stick model of monolayer MOS2. Bulk silicon or any other 3D crystal, as you all know, is just a basis of atoms repeated quasi-infinitely across a Bravais lattice. And you can rotate this 3D crystal in any dimension you like and recover the original crystal. MOS2, on the other hand, or any other 2D material for that matter, is actually composed of trillions of individual nanosheets stacked on top of each other. And we can actually make individual 2D nanosheets like this in the lab. And I say 2D because although this guy does have a finite thickness of about 7 angstroms, give or take, both electrons and phonons zipping around in here behave like you would expect them to in a 2D system. Well, what exactly does that mean to behave like you're in a 2D system? Uh, electronically speaking, it makes the band structure a little easier to visualize since you have one less dimension to keep track of. Without getting into the gritty details of this, it can actually be exemplified by looking at conduction surfaces in the first Brillouin zone. So here I'm showing the first Brio one zone of both silicon and MOS2, and hopefully the first one on the left here is at least somewhat familiar to you from your basic device physics courses, uh, along with the constant energy surfaces near the conduction band minima. So in silicon we have this six-fold degenerate conduction band minimum, uh, 
where the curvature of this constant energy surface is indicative of the effective mass along a given direction. So conducting in the one zero zero direction, for example, you have four of these valleys with a very small effective mass and two with a large effective mass, and averaging these gives the well-known value of about 0.25 for the conductivity mass of electrons in silicon. But now if you look at the first Briouin zone of monolayer MOS2, its constant energy surfaces aren't 3D ellipsoids anymore. They are actually almost perfectly isotropic 2D ellipses, or circles. Uh, sometimes this is drawn in 3D uh, for bulk MOS2 as a 3D ellipsoid, but with a very large out-of-plane radius, meaning that it has a very large out-of-plane effective mass, uh, if you want to think about it that way. So what this tells us, basically, uh, is that the electrons can move very easily in the plane of the MOS2, but it's very difficult to scatter the electrons out of the plane or out of the material, which you might expect for a two-dimensional electron gas confined in such a way. Another benefit that MOS2 and other 2D DMDs have over bulk semiconductors when they've been thinned down to atomic levels is what is known as this van der Waals gap. So if we go to the structure of bulk MOS2 and look at it, we see that the crystal is composed of lots of these nanosheets, but there's this intrinsic space between them because the nanosheets only bond to each other through van der Waals forces, which are very, very weak. So if you peel only one of these guys off and put him on, say, SiO2 or whatever your favorite dielectric material is, that van der Waals gap is still there. Uh, and there aren't any dangling bonds, and so to first order, the electronic and thermal properties of this guy are largely unaffected by the environment around him. If you take bulk silicon, on the other hand, and try to make it less than a nanometer thick, so one or maybe two unit cells high, then basically every atom on here has a dangling bond that's going to contribute to scattering centers by either bonding with something in the outside environment or with its own localized charge or something else. Uh, not to mention the fact that band structure changes when you shrink silicon this thin, uh, like the band gap shoots up to almost two electron volts and transverse effective mass increases by several times and all of these effects together serve to degrade the overall mobility of the material because at heart silicon is three-dimensional. So shifting now to more device-oriented concepts, as I mentioned before when you shrink 3D SOI down to less than a nanometer uh, their mobilities go down very quickly but these 2D materials maintain their mobility values because they were really less than a nanometer to begin with anyway. But in addition to that, these materials have other properties that make them attractive for ultimately scaled transistor architectures, and it can be sort of non-intuitive, so let me walk you through it. Silicon, you know, has a band gap of 1.12 electron volts and a conductivity effective mass of about 0.25. And due to mobility degradation, as we make these things thinner and thinner, people have started looking at 3.5 materials, which have a smaller band gap and effective mass, but in turn boost this mobility value back up. But monolayer MOS2 has a band gap of 1.8 electron volts and a conductivity mass of 0.45. Uh, so how on earth can that be any better? Well, as it turns out, the devices are becoming so short now that Dibble isn't the only short channel effect anymore. And the main problems for shorter devices are starting to become other leakage paths, such as band-to-band -band tunneling leakage. Uh, and this can be direct source drain tunneling for very, very short length devices. But there's also this concept known as Giddle or gate-induced drain leakage, where the high surface potential in the channel bends the bands so much that carriers can tunnel between the bands directly below the gate in transistors that are even several hundreds of nanometers long. And this is mainly because uh, device dimensions are continuing to scale down while voltages are not, so these uh, fields are much stronger. And the tunneling rate for band-to-band -band tunneling, uh, no matter what the type, is proportional to this factor right here. So it's pretty easy to see how an effective mass twice as large and a band gap 50% bigger can go a long way in reducing these leakage paths for MOS2. Additionally, the large effective mass means that if you want to define your op current at, say, 100 nanoamps per micron, uh, you can have the off state barrier lower for the same leakage, and then when you turn your gate on, the on state barrier will also be lower, which actually allows for more current to flow. This is best demonstrated with the help of some simulations, uh, and these plots are a little difficult to read at first glance, so uh, let me explain them. These plots on the left here show the conduction band profile and energy-specific current density for 5 nanometer transistors made with monolayer MOS2 and 3 nanometer UTB SOI. You're all familiar with energy band diagrams here, but this other triangle looking thingy, uh, basically the total area in here is the total current. So these simulations were done with a VDD of 0.4 volts and an off-current stipulation of 5 nanoamps per micron. Uh, so these are the off-state currents, and maybe you can convince yourself that the area in both of these triangles uh, totals 5 nanoamps per micron. But here you can see the actual energy barrier in MOS2 
is much smaller than silicon, and this is possible because the effective mass is about twice as large here. Now if we apply a bias to the gate to turn them on, the barrier in MOS2 is again smaller, and it's this fact that actually allows for about 150% more current to flow despite MOS2 having a heavier effective mass. So this is perhaps better visualized in an IDVG plot uh, comparing the two. You can see that for the same off current, MOS2 actually has a steeper subthreshold slope and a higher on current. And this is actually all thanks to the higher effective mass allowing the barrier to be lower in the first place, which is pretty neat, right? It's kind of non-intuitive. So this is a table that pops up in a lot of device classes here at Stanford, showing important values for silicon and possible replacement materials, and now I've added MOS2 to it. You might notice that all of these numbers, except for the band gap, are significantly lower in MOS2, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, as I've just demonstrated. Although the higher mobility of the 3.5 materials does mean they can more easily achieve a higher on current, it also means they will have higher leakage currents in the off state. Uh, the larger dielectric constant also increases both the depletion capacitance and the natural scaling links of these devices. So metrics such as subthreshold swing, uh, scaling length, and dibble are all going to suffer in the high mobility 3.5 materials. But because all of these values are lower for monolayer MOS2, even with a planar single gated architecture, MOS2 has a minimum gate length less than half the value for a double gated silicon FET, which if you remember was 9 or 10. And this is one of the main motivations driving interest in 2D TMDs, in addition to the types of simulations that I just previously showed. So while it's great that 3.5 materials can hit and even exceed ITRS specs for the on-current and ultra-scale devices, it can be very difficult to make them thin enough to maintain electrostatic control without degrading mobility, and it's also difficult to really turn them fully off when you get them that small. But it's actually pretty easy to turn off 2D TMDs, and when they're off, they're really off which you can see here in a log scale IDVG curve of some of our experimental devices. Uh, and you can get differences in current of over uh, eight orders of magnitude if you have really high quality stuff. Some IDVD curves are also shown here, and depending on where you come from, you might think that these numbers are pretty low compared to silicon. Uh, but either way, this range of several hundred microamps per micron seems to be the highest demonstrated current drive for monolayer TMDs uh, to date, uh, though this device is actually heavy, heavily limited by contact resistance, so there's still plenty of room for improving the state of the art here. One other potential advantage to the 2D materials is that they might, and take this with a grain of salt, allow for a return to planar SOI type architectures due to how thin they are, which will allow for a good electrostatic control without the FinFET geometry. So for logic applications, the main reason high performance devices need drive currents in the range of milliamps per micron is to get transistors to fully switch by charging all of these capacitances in some given amount of time. But if you can reduce these parasitic capacitances, the constraints on how much current you need to drive also goes down. So what really matters is this quantity CV over I, which reflects this pretty directly. If, because of the 2D properties of these materials, you can reduce all of these parasitic capacitances you get with FinFETs or nanowire FETs while still maintaining electrostatic control, then you can also reduce the amount of current you need to drive by the same amount for the same voltage. So at the end of the day, it might not matter that these materials can only drive a third or half of a milliamp per micron, as long as they don't have all of the leakage and parasitic capacitance issues that are currently plaguing the 3D semiconductors. As we all know, there's no free lunch. Uh, these materials are still in their infancy, and there are many challenges to be overcome before industry is going to start seriously considering these materials. Uh, the biggest issue by far is probably doping. You can't substitutionally dope these semiconductors the way you can 3D materials because any amount of ion implantation will actually totally destroy it uh, because it's less than a nanometer thick. There's no uh, epitaxial substrate to reconstruct the crystal after uh, an anneal. So for the channel, that's a problem because it makes it a bit difficult to control the threshold voltage. Uh, you're pretty much determining the threshold voltage entirely with the gate metal works function and any fixed charge uh, in the oxide or at the interface. Uh, but to be fair, FDSOI actually has this issue as well, since there is really no body there to dope either. But uh, this lack of doping also makes fabricating ohmic contacts of these things incredibly difficult, uh, because without some kind of degenerate doping in the semiconductor, there's always going to be this sizable shock key barrier, and carriers are only going to be injected into the channel through thermionic emission rather than through field emission through the shock key barrier, as is done for silicon and modern transistors.
So there are some tricks being exploited in academia right now, including chemical doping and phase changing the contacts to metallic MOS2, uh, but nobody has really demonstrated this at a system level yet. Uh, the final and arguably biggest issue is integrating these materials with already existing technologies. A lot of the processing tricks that work perfectly well for cleaning and processing three-dimensional materials will totally destroy these two-dimensional materials, oxygen plasma probably being the best example of this. Uh, with silicon, uh, after a litho etch step, if you have some photoresist scum left over, you can just zap it with O2 plasma or anneal it in ozone or something uh, to get rid of the organics. Or you can run it through what's called a piranha bath, which is sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, but you can't do that with these 2D materials because all of these things will actually eat the moss too as well. So there's lots of issues that still need to be hammered out, but this field has only been around for about five years, so there's still plenty of room to grow. So just quickly to recap here, lower dimensional materials can be better suited for ultimately scaled technology nodes than 3D materials because they're not afraid of being made that small. Some advantages include the inherently two-dimensional band structure and van der Waals bonding for maintaining its electrical conductivity when made atomically thin, uh, a larger band gap and effective mass for reducing band-to-band -band tunneling leakage, and the possibility of returning to a planar architecture while still maintaining the all-important CV over I metric. And the same properties that are good for the 2D materials are also bad for the 2D materials, uh, and the problems that still need to be worked out before any of this is really viable is uh, first finding a way to selectively dope these things, uh, and second figuring out how to integrate these 2D materials with three-dimensional materials, and finally convincing these new kids on the block to play nice in the playground, or rather getting these things to behave in the fab with tools that were designed for three-dimensional materials. So I hope this has provided you with a brief overview of two-dimensional materials and the advantages they might offer over conventional semiconductors for ultimately scaled transistor architectures, as well as the problems that still need to be ironed out.